What if I told you that cannabis's real impact on our society isn't going to be medical or recreational? It's going to be industrial. Every 60 seconds in the U.S., we lose three acres of farmland to climate change and to urban sprawl. Now, in that same minute, all over the world, 250 babies are born and 105 people die. Now, each one of those new babies is going to need food, clothing, and shelter for the rest of their historically long lives. That's about 72 years of the current average. Now, that's a problem for us because it means that our generation is going to have to provide for more people than ever before with fewer natural resources than ever before. And we're going to have to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't make climate change even worse. Which brings us to our current situation. If we expect to thrive in the future, not just as a country, but as a species, then we have until 2050 to get the entire global economy to net zero emissions so we can keep climate change under control and avoid the worst of the warming. That is a single generation. Now, for reference, U.S. emissions actually did go down in 2020 by almost 10%, which is awesome. But the only reason that happened, really, is because the COVID-19 pandemic has essentially shut off our economy for the last 12 months. That's not a long-term strategy. Now, as we start to recover, we have to find ways to get our emissions down by 10% every single year if we're going to keep the situation in check. We are in the beginning stages of what is without a doubt the biggest environmental, economic, and logistical challenge that humanity has ever faced. And I want to take a second here and just get away from the abstractions and remind everybody what failure to solve this problem really looks like. Failure to achieve net zero emissions on time means that climate change just keeps on getting worse, possibly past the point of no return. It means that tens of millions of people, possibly hundreds of millions of people, are going to die from starvation, disease, and extreme weather events. It could mean that our kids inherit a dangerously unstable world where conflict and world war are back on the menu. It's not hyperbole at all to say that achieving net zero emissions is the biggest issue of the 21st century and the greatest challenge of our generation. But how can we fix our economic system without sacrificing the real progress that's been made? How can we decarbonize an economy addicted to fossil fuels without destroying it? Well, the answer is we can't decarbonize it, at least not entirely. The problem with trying to take carbon out of the picture altogether is that it's just it's just not practical. Yeah, decarbonization makes sense in some places. Technologies like wind and solar energy, electric vehicles, these can significantly reduce our need for fossil fuels, but oil is used for a lot more than just energy and transport. Organic chemistry is based on carbon, and a lot of our best stuff comes from the carbons that we find in oil. Useful stuff, things like fertilizers and medicines, plastics, and pretty much all of our chemicals. So unless we're willing to forego modern technology and just lop a few decades off the global life expectancy, we can't get rid of carbon altogether. What we can do is transition from making our stuff out of fossil-based carbon sources like oil and gas to using renewable carbon. Now, renewable carbon is a very simple concept. Instead of adding more and more and more carbon into the atmosphere by extracting new fossil fuels out of the ground, we can actually take the carbon that's already been emitted into the atmosphere and recycle it using one of nature's oldest and most powerful tools, photosynthesis, the growing of plants. Instead of digging our carbon out of the geosphere, we can actually grow it in the biosphere using what's already in the air. That way, the net amount of carbon in the system stays exactly the same. This is what carbon neutrality means. The equivalent to decarbonization in the energy and transportation sectors is for chemical and material industries to transition from fossil-based carbon sources to renewable carbon sources. This is where industrial hemp comes in. Now, industrial hemp refers to the plant cannabis sativa L. Not that one. This one. And this one. And those ones. And this one. You see, cannabis is a lot like dogs. There are hundreds of different breeds of cannabis that we call cultivars. Now, like dog breeds, these cultivars have been bred for specific purposes, and they look and behave very differently from each other. You've probably heard about CBD at this point, which comes from high cannabinoid cultivars, but you might not be aware of industrial hemp or how the two differ. Industrial hemp refers to cultivars that have been bred specifically for their fiber. These are plants that can grow up to 20 feet tall and look more like corn or sugarcane than cannabis. Hemp fiber is the strongest natural fiber in the world, but more importantly, it is incredibly versatile. The reason that hemp is such a big deal 
is because it is one of the only renewable resources we have that can hold a candle to the versatility of petroleum. There are more than 25,000 different carbon neutral, low waste products that can be manufactured out of hemp. Everything from bioplastics and chemicals to environmentally friendly building materials and textiles, even advanced stuff like graphene and supercapacitors. All of these can be made affordably and in an environmentally neutral way out of hemp. To understand why that is, why hemp is such an ideal source of renewable carbon, we have to take a look at the carbon cycle itself. Now, if high school was a long time ago, don't worry, we're going to do a quick recap here. The carbon cycle is the process by which carbon flows from the atmosphere into plants and animals, into the earth, and then back into the atmosphere. It is a key tool that the planet uses to regulate its temperature. Now, ordinarily, the carbon cycle is a closed system. It's a zero-sum game. Just as much carbon gets released into the atmosphere as gets absorbed. Plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They release those oxygen molecules. They store the carbon in the structure of the plant itself. And then either that plant will eventually die and release that carbon back into the atmosphere through decomposition, or it'll be consumed by an organism and released in the form of methane. The problem is that human activities have added so much extra carbon to this cycle that it has become completely out of balance. And now we have to find ways to get rid of all that extra carbon in order to mitigate the effects of climate change. Now, the first thing we need to do here is stop the bleeding. We can't afford to keep adding more and more and more carbon into this system. It's not sustainable. Clearly, fossil-based carbon sources are not a long-term solution. We have to build an emissions-neutral, circular carbon economy as the basis for most of our physical products and materials. This is where hemp can play its role. Now, it might not be the lead role, but it is definitely in the running for best supporting character. Like every other plant in the world, hemp grows through photosynthesis. Again, it takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It releases the oxygen. It stores that carbon in the structure of the plant, in its fiber. But then instead of decomposing or getting eaten, we can actually turn that plant into a product. When you see a, a product that's been made out of industrial hemp, say, say a plastic spoon, for example, that product was quite literally made by taking carbon out of the atmosphere and transforming it into something useful. This is why hemp products can be carbon neutral. And if you do it right, they can even be carbon negative. They can actually take more carbon out of the atmosphere than it takes to manufacture the materials themselves. Now, I need to be really careful here because no one's doing that successfully at scale yet, but even if these products don't quite add up to net carbon negativity, it is still a huge improvement over the current system we have because most of the carbon savings that we're talking about here, upwards of 70%, come from not having to drill, extract, and refine oil in the first place. Now, the other major benefit to hemp as a natural resource is its ability to reduce deforestation. There is no better carbon capture technology yet invented than the tree. And so long as we live in a world where trees are worth more dead than alive, well, solving the climate crisis is probably going to remain out of reach. Since 1990, the Earth has lost more than 320 million square acres of forested land. That is an area slightly larger than the entire country of South Africa. So much forest is lost each year, as a matter of fact, that if deforestation was a country, it would rank third in the world for carbon equivalent emissions, right after China and the U.S. Hemp can help reduce deforestation by replacing a number of timber products. In addition to the plant's fiber, the core of the plant is made from this woody material over here that we call the herd. Now, if you think to yourself, hey, that looks a lot like wood chips, you're right, it's exactly like wood chips. And it can be used for any application that wood chips are currently used for. It's not normally used to replace load-bearing lumber, but hemp can replace trees as the primary source of paper and pulp products, which make up more than 40% of all timber consumption. Every year, we produce more than 400 million metric tons of paper, and it costs us more than a billion trees. Think about that, a billion trees every single year. These are trees that would otherwise be left standing, doing what trees do, eating up carbon and maintaining biodiversity. But it doesn't stop there. Hemp can replace a whole swath of timber products. Particle board, charcoal, and flooring, these three categories alone cost us more than 55 billion pounds of wood annually. All of them can be manufactured affordably and with the same quality out of hemp. Anything wood can do, hemp can do cleaner. In countries like Brazil, where more than 20% of the Amazon rainforest has been destroyed due to illegal logging, hemp replacing wood for charcoal alone 
could save more than 100 million trees. By replacing lumber products in a carbon neutral way with hemp, we can leave billions upon billions of more trees standing to do what they do best, sequester even more carbon. Now, climate change is a time-sensitive issue. It's actually, it's actually the time-sensitive issue. The sooner we can get to net zero emissions, the better our odds are of getting out of the 21st century intact. One of the best arguments for industrial hemp, then, is the speed with which it can be deployed. This is a technology that we already understand for the most part, and we can bring it up to scale whenever we decide that we want to. We can't afford to wait around for flying cars or some vague miracle technology that we might discover to save us. We need to take action now. Not in 10 years, not in five years, not next year, now. Industrial hemp can help us wean the economy off of fossil fuels and onto a more renewable track. Still, it is important not to exaggerate, especially in my industry. Industrial hemp has a lot of potential, but it's not a panacea. Okay, hemp's not gonna solve the climate crisis all by itself, and it's not a miracle crop. It's another tool in our arsenal against the biggest threat facing the world today. Hemp's not gonna save the world, but it sure could help.